Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Revolution 250 podcast. I'm Bob Allison. I chair the Rev 250 advisory group. I also teach history at Suffolk University. And our guest today is Eric J. Dolan. Welcome, Eric. Uh, thanks for having me. And Eric Dolan is an author. He actually has a PhD from MIT in environmental policy and planning. And after a number of years working in environmental policy, he actually worked as, for the Office of Marine Safety for the National Transportation Safety Board and for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. He's turned to history. His first history book, I think, was Leviathan. I actually wrote a book on political waters about Boston Harbor. Very interesting. St great story about Boston yeah. Harbor. I mean, that is one of the central yeah. stories of the 20th century, 21st century Boston. Uh, but we're here to talk about earlier history. So Leviathan was about whaling. He wrote a book about um, China and the United States when America met China and a book about the fur trade and a book about pirates, black mm -hmm. flags, blue waters, and also a book about lighthouses. But his most recent book is about privateers, rebels at sea, privateering in the American Revolution. So welcome, Eric. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. And I know it's bad form to correct the host, but I actually did write about five or six books before Leviathan. But the thing is, nobody read them. So. Uh, well, I, I know the feeling. I've written a lot of books nobody's read. So, uh, yeah, you wrote a book about the duck stamp. And, yeah, duck stamp and, program. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah, yes. So, so a prolific a writer. Before turning to history, I was just focusing on the history as opposed right. to oh, the... Right. Okay. Well, I'm glad people are reading the history books. Yeah, no, it's been it's been great. It's been a fun, fun ride. So what brought you to the story of privateers? Well, as you mentioned, I wrote a book called Black Flags, Blue Waters, which was uh, the history of pirating during the golden age of pirating, the late 1600s and the early 1700s. And in that book, there are a number of former privateers who became pirates. There are a number of privateers in name who were really pirates in action. And uh, whenever I would give a talk on that book, a lot of people would ask me about privateering and isn't privateering just legalized piracy. And back then, in fact, it was in many instances. And the great example is during King William's War in the late 1600s, there were a number of privateers that were given letters of mark in the American colonies to go fight against the French because England and France were at war. However, uh, these letters of mark were sold at 300 pounds of pop by colonial governors and those quote unquote privateers went around uh, Cape of Good Hope into the Indian Ocean and they attacked Mughal shipping mm. transiting between the Indian subcontinent and the Red Sea ports of Jeddah and Mocha. So they were in fact pirates, mm -hmm. though they had letters of mark. Yeah. And the Americans yeah. you know, loved them because they came back to the colonies and brought money to the, sure. uh, the, the starved colonies. So I knew that there were privateers that were in fact legalized pirates. And one of the things that in many of my books I talked about is the American Revolution, but only in little, you know, a mm -hmm. chapter, maybe half a chapter. So I've always been fascinated by the American Revolution. And I had heard that there were privateers and privateering during the American Revolution. I didn't know much about it. I started looking into it and I realized, one, they were not legalized pirates. They were of a mm -hmm. different stripe. But what made it even more interesting to me and the reason I wrote the book is because I wasn't finding a lot in modern books on American, mm -hmm. on the American Revolution, and certainly modern books on the maritime history of the American Revolution that focused on privateering. There was such an emphasis on the Continental Navy and right. on land battles. And I said, well, there's a story here about privateering, and it's fascinating, and it deals with maritime issues, which is one of my main mm -hmm. interests. I live here in Marblehead. I love being near the ocean, and there's, there's something about those stories that's very compelling. But the real reason I decided to write the book is that I felt that it was a story that to modern audiences was relatively unknown. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's, that's where the idea came from. Yeah, it really is. And you make the case, you know, we focus on John Glover and we focus on uh, John Paul Jones, but you make the case that the privateers actually had more of an impact on trade, on British trade, British policy than the, the really very small American Navy did. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the Continental Navy was only about 60 vessels that were operating in the Atlantic. And you think about it, a government that was well-funded and well-functioning 
would have a diff difficult time whipping mm -hmm. up a navy within a short span, a short period. The uh, Continental Congress <laughs> was anything but. It wasn't mm -hmm. a particularly well-functioning government in many senses. And it was like herding cats. The 13 yeah. colonies were sort of like independent countries, at least at the beginning of the revolution. So trying to get them to all pull together. And then on top of that, not having the ability to levy taxes to pay for this massive outlay that was required to build a Navy and purchase a Navy. It's no surprise that the Continental Navy came to life very haltingly mm -hmm, and yeah. even some of the frigates that were built they had to be built so quickly that the wood wasn't allowed to season so some of the wood in the hulls of these ships was green which causes mm. great problems as it continues to contract or dry or mold yeah. like mildew yeah. uh, when it goes to sea so the continental navy this was its first hour definitely mm -hmm. it wasn't its finest hour no and they captured about 200 prizes even john paul jones who people sort of mythologize into a hero i think that is greater than he actually mm -hmm. was although he did some great things even his signature battle where the bonhomme richard attacks and defeats the Serapis was sort of a Pyrrhic victory. The Bone Home Richard sank to the bottom of the ocean right. and yeah. he had more than a hundred of his men killed and the convoy that he had been specifically targeting got away during right. the fighting. Yeah. So the Continental Navy yeah. did have an impact. Uh, it, it wasn't that great. Uh, Washington's secret Navy, which you talk about the Hannah and uh, sure. General Glover, who is a, a patron saint of Marblehead where I right. live, you know, they did a lot of things and they brought in munitions at the beginning of the war. But mm -hmm. in terms of sheer numbers and sheer impact, the privateers, of which there were probably close to 2000 operating <laughs> during the American Revolution, captured nearly 2000 British ships. And they had impacts and went far beyond just capturing those ships. They brought goods and, and mm -hmm. munitions and some prisoners back to the colonies. And those goods were very important to the colonies. They also, one thing that a lot of people don't lose sight of, I think, is that privateering during the American Revolution was probably one of the largest industries in the colonies. So hmm. that's somewhere in the order of maybe 20 to 30,000 men who were fighting on these privateers. Hmm. And uh, to outfit those privateers, uh, kept a lot of the local economies going, and it kept these men employed. Now, the flip side of that, and a big part of the book that I talk about, is mm -hmm. the sad story and ending of so many privateersmen who were captured. More right. than 10,000 privateersmen died mm -hmm. on British prison ships. And that is a shocking story. But on balance, the point in the book is not that privateers were the reason we won mm -hmm. the American Revolution. As George Washington said, and you well know, it was a standing miracle that we won the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. And there were many, many reasons that went into that success. And if different decisions had been made and if troops had shown up Go three ahead. days later or three days earlier, it might have been, been a different outcome. So my point is that privateering is one of many elements in this jigsaw puzzle, along with George Washington's great leadership, the French fleet arriving right. off Yorktown. I mean, a lot of different things had to go right for us to win. The right. last, last thing I wanted to mention, and this uh, people, when I give a talk on this book, they seem to get a kick out of this because, you know, we're Americans now and we broke free from the British. But I got to say, the more I've read about the American Revolution and the more of a student of the revolution I've become, you realize that the British, if they hadn't been so amazingly arrogant at the outset of this conflict, and they hadn't viewed all us Americans as rabbles in arms, mm -hmm. should have, and I think could have, won the war early oh, yeah. on. Uh, it really is amazing. It was a lost opportunity on their part. I'm happy they lost, because if they didn't, we wouldn't be here talking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Right, right. So thank you. We're talking with Eric J. Dole, an author of Rebels at Sea, Privateering in the American Revolution. Also, the states created navies, too. You talk a lot right. about the Connecticut's Navy, the Massachusetts Navy. So what are they doing, these state right. navies? Well, the state navies, basically in 1775, the summer of 1775, the Continental Congress sent out a letter to the colonies saying, listen, the British are clamping down on our commerce. They are attacking us. We don't, we're not ready to declare our independence, but we've got to defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. So they recommended that the colonies put together maritime defenses. And many of the, a number of the colonies did. 
and the lead was Rhode Island and Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And these are relatively small, the state navies, but they were involved in both attacking British ships that they came near to the coastline and protecting ports. Some of them went further afield and even across the Atlantic, but most of them hugged the east coast of the colonies and sort of protected state commerce. And they had some significant victories. Mm -hmm. But again, there are only about maybe 40 or 50 uh, state naval vessels at any one time. And another thing to keep in mind is that a lot of men who fought on privateers also would have been at various times on continental Navy vessels, mm -hmm. on state naval vessels, and maybe in Washington's secret navy so there was sort of mm -hmm. a cross-pollination of people mm -hmm. especially from the continental navy and officers because there were so few ships and so many officers that wanted mm -hmm. positions there weren't enough spots available so many of our best known you know continental navy men Tr thomas trucks yeah. john barry they were navy men true but they also when they couldn't get a navy ship to right. command they became privateersmen. Mm -hmm. Now, was it more lucrative to be a privateersman than to be in the Navy? If you capture a ship, what happens? Uh, yeah. You well, if you capture a ship, in, in the, I mean, the, another thing is that in the Navy, you got paid a base salary, but mm -hmm. you also had an incentive program. There was a profit motive in the Navy as well as with privateers. And the profit mm -hmm. motive was that if you captured a ship, the men on board the naval vessel could share in 50% of the profits. The other half of it would go to the Continental Congress. On mm -hmm. a privateer, the men on board the ship would also share in 50% of the profits. So it seems like it would be a one for one. Why would you mm -hmm. want to yeah. not go into the Navy? But the truth is privateers had shorter cruises. They were right. able to go wherever they wanted to seek out prey. Mm -hmm. uh, Continental naval vessels had more rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. They had to go to specific places. They sometimes were engaged in diplomatic duty and protecting mm -hmm. ports. Right. Uh, so there, so basically a privateer offered the possibility of greater profits at a more rapid rate. It didn't always work out that way, mm -hmm. yeah. but that's what many, many men viewed their uh, choice as being. And it's very true that a lot of men who would have otherwise gone on to naval vessels decided to go on to privateers. But you have to keep in mind, that doesn't mean that had there been no privateering, that our Continental Navy would yeah. have suddenly been a fearsome fighting force. The Continental Congress wouldn't have, have suddenly had more money to spend right. on a Continental Navy. So in the absence of that, that's one way to look at privateering. It was our best alternative. It was a free yeah. militia. It was a free Navy, a cost-free Navy. Right. And it could be whipped up very quickly with a lot of uh, ships that could be armaments could be added and individuals could be added to the crew so they could mm -hmm. become powerful fighting forces. But they weren't intended, just like the Continental Navy. Everybody, everybody views the Continental Navy. They're going to go out there toe to toe with the British Navy. Mm -hmm. Nothing could be further from the truth. No, that yeah. was not the intention. There's no way that these Continental Navy frigates, which are fairly small, are going to go up against the ship of the line and do well. And they mm -hmm. didn't. So yeah. they actually were intended to do the very same thing that privateers were intended to do, mm -hmm. which go out and harass British merchant shipping. And mm -hmm. most of their captures were British merchant ships, just like the Americans, just like the privateers. Right. So, yeah. uh, you know, keep it in perspective. <laughs> yeah, that's true. We're talking with Eric J. Dole, an author of Rebels at Sea. And there also was a fear that if we do build a navy, that's going to provoke the British, a much bigger navy to attack right. us, a much bigger navy than we could possibly build. Right. You know, the, the whole first year of the American Revolution, basically 1775 up through the Declaration of Independence, is this very strange nether period in the American colonies where they really couldn't make up their mind as to what they were doing. At first, they thought it was Parliament mm -hmm. that was waging war against them and not King George III. And then they decided, well, King George III is being pretty much a lousy individual as well, yeah. but we aren't quite ready to declare our independence. And through all of this, the New England has been clamped down on Massachusetts and Boston. Mm -hmm. The metropolis of sedition is being picked on mm -hmm. most heavily. And the colonists realize that they have to fight back somehow. And it slowly morphs from a defensive war, which is really an offensive war in a sense, mm -hmm. to a fully yeah. offensive war after mm -hmm. the Declaration of Independence. And the goal was to win. 
And when you mm -hmm. want to win, you want to take advantage of every single opportunity that you can. And privateering was one of the ready-made opportunities because mm -hmm. remember, the American colonists during the Seven Years' War and the War of Jenkins Ear, and earlier wars, when they were part of the mother country, they were British citizens. A lot mm -hmm. of American colonists got onto their ships and became privateersmen and did quite well. So in fact, the American who went out and became privateersmen during the revolution had the tutelage of their British compatriots right to thank for giving them the tools and the knowledge and the ability to uh, mm -hmm. pursue privateering in an effective way. Mm. Let's talk a little bit about some of the people who become privateers. I mean, you have fascinating stories about some of the officers as well as some of the men you found something out about. Um, let me ask you if you have a favorite having finished the book. <laughs> well, I, I'd have to say uh, sort of maybe two favorites. Uh, one is the guy that I start the book off with, uh, which is Jonathan Harridan, a man mm -hmm. who was born in Gloucester, but uh, got his sailing chops in Salem and went out on a vessel called the Pickering, uh, which was actually a letter of mark privateer, which means they all had letters of mark, but right. his, the Pickering could trade and attack British ships. And he was going to, the thing that he's most famous for is he was going to Bilbao, which was an ally, uh, Bilbao, mm -hmm. the port of Bilbao in Spain with uh, a, a cargo in June of 1780. And along the way, he captured the Golden Eagle, which was a British ship. But then when he got to Bilbao, right off Bilbao, the Achilles, a much larger ship, the Pickering had 38 men on board and they had 16 cannons. The Achilles had 143 men on board and about 43 cannons. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a fair fight. No. But uh, Harridan wouldn't back down. He said, I shan't run from her. And they had a battle which lasted for two hours. And then mm -hmm. Harridan had his men load the cannons with bar shot, which is a, which are basically cannonballs that are connected by iron bars. Mm -hmm. Once they exit the cannon, they spin wildly and they can shred the rigging and sails and even a mast mm -hmm. or a spar. So the Achilles was damaged very severely. And even though Harridan didn't capture the Achilles, the Achilles ran off and Harridan wasn't fast enough to capture it. But mm -hmm. the people in Bilbao knew that this battle was about to take place because the two ships squared off against each other late in the afternoon and the mm -hmm. battle was the next morning. So about a thousand people from Bilbao wow. went down to the beach to watch this spectacle offshore. So when he came into port, Harridan and his men were treated as, you know, kings almost. Right, yeah. They had defeated wow. the hated British ship. Mm -hmm. And he actually recaptured the Golden Eagle, which the Achilles had briefly taken back. And then on the way back to Salem, Harridan captured three more British prizes. And mm. so he had a very successful career when he died in 1803 of tuberculosis at the age of 59. The Salem Gazette lauded him as one of the mm. most capable and successful men of the revolution. And I want to add this one story, which just yeah. emblem is emblematic to me of how privateering has been disregarded in history over time. While I was working on the book, and this isn't in the book, while I was working on the book, I read about a plaque that the Sons of the American Revolution had put in Salem on the side of a house where Harridan had lived. That was a three and a half foot tall by two and a half foot plaque that basically memorialized his battle with the Achilles. Mm -hmm. So. I got on my bike. I was in Marblehead. This is during mm -hmm. COVID. They said it was right where the Witch House Museum is and mm -hmm. where the Witch House is. So I rode my bike over there and I looked diligently. I found a couple of plaques. I didn't find this one. I went home discouraged. I called a local historian and I said, where is that plaque for Harridan? Because his tombstone is in mm -hmm. Salem, actually. Mm -hmm. So I said, where's that plaque? And she goes, well, you're not going to like this or it's, it's, you're going to laugh at this. That plaque is now in a Korean barbecue restaurant about a block or two away from the witch house. They have no idea how it ended up there. So I rode my bike back over. And I'm wearing my mask. I walk into the restaurant. The woman there is so excited because they have no customers. Yeah. She, thinks, she thinks I'm there to order food. I said, I'm sorry, I'm not here to order food. I'm here to look at that plaque behind your head, right behind the cash register. Wow. Gorgeous plaque. Wow. She had no idea how it was there. Wow. But to me, the fact that the plaque ended up there is a symbol of mm -hmm. how privateering has been relegated to the back dark recesses of the yeah. history 
of the American Revolution. So I just thought that was a great story. Uh, it is. It, it, I, don't know, I don't know what, well, it didn't make it into the book because my editor didn't like the picture of the plaque. I don't know why. And after debating that, we decided, eh, just leave it out. Wow. But, it's a great but, story. And the, I, I wonder how it got there. I, you didn't even order some kimchi or something? No, I, I to, did. Uh, sorry, uh, no, I, I did. Uh, <laughs> I, I went out. Wow. If anybody wants to see the plaque and they go to Salem, Massachusetts, there's an antique store on the corner that used to be Jerry's Army Navy store. Mm -hmm. It's right next to that, the restaurant. I, I don't okay. know if the restaurant's still there. I haven't been to Salem for a while, and a lot of restaurants go in and out of business. Yeah, yeah, there, was, yeah. there was another restaurant there before. But one other, she asked me about stories. One other quick story is about James Fortin, who is a mm -hmm. free black yes. man in Philadelphia who signed on to the Royal Lewis, which was a privateer captain by Stephen Decatur Sr. that mm -hmm. left out of Philadelphia. The first cruise was very successful. They mm -hmm. came back with seven prizes. He signed up again. He was what was called at the time a powder monkey. He would bring ammunition from the magazine to the cannons to enable them to be fired. And uh, he shouldn't have been so eager in hindsight to go out on the second voyage because just a day out of port, the Royal Lewis was captured by the HMS Amphion. And mm -hmm. the captain of the HMS Amphion was a guy named John Baisley. And uh, Fortin was very worried because as he wrote later, men of his complexion would usually be sent to slave marts if they were mm -hmm. captured by the British. And he feared that that would be mm -hmm. his destiny. But uh, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, we don't know quite why he did this. Captain John Baisley had a 12 year old on board. We know why that is. Mm -hmm. He had a 12 year old son on board. And he chose James Fortin to be his companion. So four hmm. or five weeks later, when they pulled into New York to deposit all the men from the Royal Lewis onto the Jersey prison ship, the yeah. hell afloat, the worst of all the prison ships, mm -hmm. Baisley turned to Fortin and said, I'll give you a choice. You can either go to England and be a ward of my son, be well-educated, have money, and have your freedom. Or you can go with your men on the Saint Royal St. Louis onto the Jersey. What's your choice? Mm -hmm. And James Fortin decided, I'm going to stick with my men. I am a patriot. Mm. I am for my country. I believe mm. the, ring, the words of the Declaration of Independence wow. that all men are created equal. Mm -hmm. And I hope that my new country is going to mm. live up to those. And he spent the rest of his life. He actually made it off the prison ship in a prisoner exchange. And he spent the rest of his life trying valiantly to get his new country to live up to its mm. soaring rhetoric, which they didn't yeah. during his time. But he actually loaned money to his friend, William Lloyd Garrison, to launch The Liberator, that famous anti-slavery newspaper yeah. that played such a role leading up to our next mm -hmm. massive war. Uh, the right. And then his daughter, Charlotte Fortin, has, I mean, he, he becomes a successful sale, sale maker in Philadelphia. Right. Well, he's a, one yes. of the leading businessmen there. And his daughter, Charlotte, is actually educated in Salem, I believe, and she's here. I think uh, so. So another interesting story. I mean, right. you build these connections with this um, big history. Um, I think you know. You also talk about uh, Macias Maine as the Lexington of the sea. I don't know if that was your you coined that or someone else did. Can you tell no, us some, a little somebody bit about else pointed that out? Yeah, you well, know, yeah. The, what the, yeah? What happens in Macias to make it important or memorable? <laughs> well, um, now you're now now you're going to learn the dirty little secret of writing history. I, I wrote the book, and I know what happened. There was basically a battle right after the Battle of Lexington Concord. There was a man from Boston. I'm just forgetting all the names. I haven't read. That okay, name. okay, I, this happened. No, so, so no, don't no, worry but, about no, but it. it's important. The basic outline is important. Yeah, People always yeah. ask me about. Somebody will come up to me and say, "Oh." What about X, Y, Z? And I'll say, oh, I, I know I know about that. And they go, you wrote about it in your book 10 years ago. Yeah, I yeah. said, well, I yeah, yeah, yeah. all these things. But basically, yeah. the story is, without the names, in Macias, Maine, what happened is after the Battle of Lexington Concord, there was a man from Boston, Ichabod Jones, if I remember correctly, who went north, and he was going to trade. Uh, he wanted to get wood for the British uh, encampment mm -hmm. in yeah. Boston. And he had often traded with Macias, Maine. The people in Macias had learned about the Battle of Lexington Concord. They weren't particularly favorably disposed towards the British. Ichabod Jones struck a hard deal. At first, they didn't want to negotiate with them. And then some people put it to a vote. And some people said, we will trade with Ichabod Jones and allow this stuff because mm -hmm. they were in a time of drought and starvation. Yeah. But other people didn't sign mm -hmm. on. 
So he says, okay, I'm going to trade with you guys, but I'm only trading with those of you who said you're going to trade yeah, with yeah, me. Yeah, and that caused yeah. the people that were left out to rise up. And this right. is horrible. I'm forgetting the main guy's name, but he's very famous up there. Don't don't ridicule me, people from Maine listening. But no. he basically went went ahead and he attacked the the Margareta and yeah, uh, yeah. the other the other vessel. Um, the 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 men from Macias, Maine, beat off mm. these two British ships, small British yeah. ships that were there to help Ichabod Jones uh, transact his business. Mm -hmm. And it was viewed, it's sort of like the maritime Lexington and Concord. Right, they, they yeah. Set up. And later on, men from Machias did become, some of them did become privateersmen. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it's it's a great story. Yeah, it really it's, is. And it's, it's, it's tangential in a sense to mm -hmm. the story of privateering. But the reason I talk about that and also the Gatsby affair in mm -hmm. Rhode Island, it's just indicative of the uh, desire and ability of Massachusetts men in particular, because at this time, Maine is mm -hmm. part of Massachusetts, to basically fight against the British when they view their rights being trampled upon. And it was mm -hmm. the precursors to the all-out war. But the reason what happened in Machias was even more interesting, well, not more interesting than Gatsby, they both were maritime encounters. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what privateering is. It's maritime encounters yeah. between yeah. the Americans and the British. And it also ties in with something you were saying earlier about the British arrogance, really. And yeah. here had, you know, instead of respecting majority rule, here Micaias has voted, yeah, we'll trade with you. He says, well, I'm only going to trade with the people who voted my way. I mean, that's right. you know, a hallmark of, um, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it's really a lot of, uh, really a lot of astonishing stories. And I don't want to start, you know, bringing up things you might not remember. And by the way, I can empathize. That's okay. I, it's okay. I'm getting older. Yeah. I, I forget yeah, yeah. things. It's fine. I'm accepting it. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of my favorite characters was Luke Ryan, who was this Irish privateer. Oh. <laughs> and he, uh, he, he gets, you know, Franklin is our agent in France, and Franklin can only give commissions to Americans. But right. Ryan essentially has this front, American front man. Right. Uh, yeah. Captain Marchant and, from uh, Connecticut. Yeah, yeah. Benjamin Franklin, the whole story of Benjamin Franklin and his privateers is fascinating, trying to encourage the French to ally with the Americans. The French were openly helping our privateering efforts and that led to increased animosity between France and Great Britain that I think contributed to them ultimately becoming our allies. But this guy, Luke Ryan, was a smuggler from Ireland and he went down to France after he was basically caught smuggling in Great Britain and he was gonna be brought up mm -hmm. on charges. So he took off to Dunkirk and he had heard that the Americans were outfitting privateers, but he knew that they needed to have American captains. So he got this guy, Marchant from Connecticut, who was basically a dupe. And mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that that's the way they, they got the privateering license, the letter of mark from Franklin. But after a while, Marchant was just so lousy at his job. And, he, and yeah. he, everybody but him seemed to realize that he wasn't really in charge of the ship because everybody on the ship were Luke Ryan's men. So finally, right, yeah. they dumped Marchand. He goes back to America and makes up his own story about what happened. And Franklin finds out about this, that really it's Luke Ryan, mm -hmm not an American who is captain of this American privateer. And true to form, Benjamin Franklin, who is more than any historical figure willing to go with the flow and just use the situation that is given him instead of wishing for something else, congratulates Luke Ryan on his successes yeah. of capturing a bunch of British ships mm -hmm. and sends him a telescope as a thank you. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Franklin wants the privateers to bring in prisoners because yeah. then he can exchange them for other Americans being held. Yeah. It's another. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of his privateers did not bring in as many prisoners. They sort yeah. of ransomed a lot of ships. They did bring in a couple of hundred prisoners, mm -hmm. but I think that was sort of a false promise. My guess is that even if they brought in more British prisoners, there would have been a very, it, 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 there wouldn't have been major prisoner exchanges because Britain didn't view it as really benefiting them at this point, mm -hmm. uh, maybe after the Fr French became allies. But up through that, it was the, the British were, you know, they of course yeah. wanted their people back, but they didn't want to let go of the Americans that they had right. captured. So there were a lot of reasons why Britain wasn't eager to engage in prisoner exchanges. And unfortunately, that affected 
our uh, prisoner ships, even what was happening in New York with the Jersey and the 17 or 18 other prison ships, the Americans wanted desperately to trade uh, prisoners for prisoners, but yeah. there were debates over what kind of prisoners mm. and when to do it, and they didn't really get very far. Mm, yeah. Another of the characters, and I hope this isn't a footnote again that's eluded you, <laughs> John Adams is being shaved by a barber named Byrne. And Byrne oh, yeah. tells him, do you, you remember this story? <laughs> yeah, I remember. That's a great story. Byrne yeah. basically is talking about, this is early on in the war when a lot of privateers are going out of Philadelphia and other ports. And Byrne, of course, like everybody else, has been reading the accounts of a lot of privateers coming back mm. with prizes and making yeah. a lot of money. So he's shaving. He must have been quite a character. He's saving John Adams. And he's complaining about all these privateers that are, you know, going out and making a boatload of money. And he tells Adams that he wanted to go out and sign up for a privateer. But his wife was against that because mm -hmm. uh, she said, I'd rather have a live husband than a dead privateer. But he basically views her recalcitrance as the reason why he's not making his fortune. Right. But the way, yeah. you know, John Adams, one of the oh, most yeah. amazing founding fathers, and he just has a way of writing. And I actually quote him at yeah. length talking about this story. And he writes it to Abigail. And he knows that a lot of his mail is being intercepted. Yeah. So he oh, basically yeah. says, you know, fine, if the British get this letter, let them have a good laugh. This is a yeah. great yeah. story. And it, it is, is a great yeah. story. Yeah. Yeah. And Adam says, what lies do we have this week? I mean, because you know, you're a barber. You're having a barber is what you do. And uh, you're poor burn, you know, with like to him said he's shaving John Adams instead of freaking these things. Uh, we could, we, I love John. John, I mean, a lot of the characters in this book were fun to write about because a lot of them are well known and a lot of them aren't. Yeah but they all have individually fascinating stories. And John Adams was a huge proponent of privateering as he was of the Navy. Yeah, yeah. We've been talking with Eric J. Dolan about his book, Rebels at Sea, Privateering in the American Revolution. Um, one other thing is, you know, Connecticut, you have these whale boats raiding across Long Island Sound. And that's one of these episodes where the line becomes blurred between privateering and piracy, right. it seems. Can right. You talk oh, absolutely. That? Yeah, it's amazing. A lot of these uh, whale boat privateers, they're in, they're in little whale boats that are 24, 25 feet long. They maybe have one swivel gun on board, some muskets. A lot of them got letters of mark from Governor Trumbull in Connecticut. Uh, but the problem was over in Long Island, Long Island was partially Tory, partially not Tory. And while a lot of the whale boat privateers stuck to their commissions and captured actually British merchant ships, sometimes British merchant ships that were much bigger than they were, yeah. a number of these whale boat privateers went rogue and they were supposed to be capturing people on the ocean. And it, was, well, it wasn't exactly clear at the beginning, but a lot of them went on to land to settle scores with right. Tories. And they were very vicious, and it caused a lot of back and forth correspondence between uh, British and American representatives. And then the, uh, you know, Governor Clinton of New York and the Governor Trumbull of Connecticut, because they were in some, sometimes these whaleboat privateers were not very discriminating. And yeah. they weren't just stringing up out and out Tories, they were stringing up patriots who just happened yeah. to live on Long Island and they were settling their own personal scores. So yes, all privateers were not acting on the up and up, but most of them were. Okay, good. Um, we've been talking with Eric J. Dole, an author of Rebels at Sea. Anything else? I mean, this is such a great book. There are so many great stories in it. I don't want to leave off and have you then say, <laughs> boy, I forgot to tell <laughs> my favorite. But, uh, no, no, you can. I, no, there are a lot of stories we could talk about, but I think this has been great. Uh, covered been. a lot of this stuff. I, I, I just, my only hope is that people who read it I mean, I was excited writing the book. It was fun writing this book. The story propelled me along. And I'm hoping that when people read it, they realize that it's a story about privateering that uses privateering as a backbone to tell a larger story yeah. about the American Revolution. And I hope they have fun reading it. It's not meant to be boring. Well, it certainly <laughs> isn't boring. And it's fun to read and interesting. And it does tell this bigger story. And you have lots of things aside from the central topic of privateering of you know, prison ships and right. state navies and and the characters i mean it's an amazing right. cast of characters and i'm maybe you could set it to music uh, <laughs> and, uh, 
a, a bunch of people have said it should be a Netflix series. I'm all for that. <laughs> oh, yeah, it definitely should be. So, well, thank, thank you so much for joining us. And okay. I want to thank our producer, Jonathan Lane, and our many listeners. You know, when we started this off, Eric, uh, almost two years ago, actually, next week is our 100th episode. We thought we'd have a handful of folks in and around Massachusetts listening, but uh, we have a pretty wide range of listeners, and I'd like to thank some of them every week. Uh, Brewster, Massachusetts, another good maritime town. Kongsberg in Norway, Caracas in Venezuela, Honolulu, another great maritime town, Clearwater, Florida, Redondo Beach, California, all points in between. Thank you all for listening. And now we will be piped out on the road to Boston. Okay.